The AI Fringe has been organized in collaboration with dozens of people and organizations with events here in London, more broadly across the UK and online as well. We all share the goal of expanding the conversation about AI safety and society, and crucially, who gets to be a part of that conversation. We're delighted that the Fringe has brought together people from across sectors, across backgrounds, and with shared interests to have these conversations. Yesterday, we had a fantastic series of sessions. We opened with some scene setting, dived into AI hype, focused on how we design for the margins, and closed by looking across the UK's research ecosystem. Today, we'll continue to expand the conversation. First, we have a conversation starting to explore how we can define AI safety, then a session on how standards can help create structure around the design and use of AI. After lunch, we'll hear from researchers who are putting responsible AI into practice, and we'll close the day by hearing from some of the most senior figures in the field. A huge thanks to all of the Fringe partners who helped us shape the program and put this event together. Now, before we dive in, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, for those of you in the room, fire exits are at the front and back of the theater. Um, all the sessions of this program are live streamed on the AI Fringe YouTube channel and recordings of each session will go up onto that same channel shortly after each event. We, of course, uh, invite you to join the AI Fringe conversation on social media. All the information on the screen behind me. Um, our X slash formerly Twitter handle is at AI Summit Fringe, all one word. The hashtag is hashtag AI Fringe. And we're also on LinkedIn if you just search for AI Fringe, AI Fringe being the keyword there. Uh, thanks in advance to everyone for supporting the Fringe Code of Conduct. Um, it's very important to the event, and it's listed on our website if you want to refer back to it. Now, tomorrow, the UK government convenes their summit on AI safety. Our first session today will explore what the term AI safety means. It'll cover what we can learn from existing safety-based governance and how such systems secure trust in critical systems by addressing a broad range of risks, not just the most extreme. This first session has been developed with the Ada Lovelace Institute. Ada is an independent research institute based here in London and with a team in Brussels, and they work to understand ethical and societal issues of data and AI. Now, I'm probably biased because before I joined the Milltown team, I was part of the Ada team, um, but I can attest not only to the amazing work that Ada does, but how dedicated and thoughtful the team is too. So our first speaker this morning is Fran Bennett, interim director of the Ada Lovelace Institute. She was previously VP of data at Helix, which uses AI to find treatments for rare diseases. She was co-founder of Mastodon C, a data science consultancy, and she was a founding trustee of DataKind UK, which provides data science support to UK charities. Please join me in welcoming Fran Bennett to the stage. Uh, morning, everyone, and, and thanks very much, Aidan. Um, so, as we said, the, the Ada Lovelace Institute is an independent research institute with a mission to make AI and data work for people in society. And as a research institute, we look for the evidence that can steer us towards that outcome. And in particular, we want to understand the areas of data and AI that have the most impact on people in society and where there's a real possibility of change. So today, I'm going to reflect on the balance of evidence as we see it around the impacts of AI and around how we should govern those technologies. You will have heard last week the suggestion that we don't know enough about AI to regulate it yet. But in fact, we do know a lot about AI. We've got over a decade of research on its risks, its limitations, how it can both help and harm people and society. And we want today's session to reflect the breadth of that research, and our panel are going to lend us some really broad perspectives on that. Um, and I want to reinforce that people are central to everything we're going to be discussing today. At ADA, amplifying the voice of the public is a really vital part of our work. It matters that people can engage with and can be involved with decision-making about AI, especially those people who are at the margins of society who often feel the greatest impact. So the topic right for today, AI safety, is, is a big one. And I'm conscious of substantial expertise in this room. But in the spirit of the fringe, I'm, I'm going to talk about safety from first principles so that it sh this should make sense to everybody. So we're kicking off this safety discussion at the fringe the day before the first international AI safety summit. And the government's agenda for the summit is, is mainly focused on technical methods for avoiding possible hypothetical extreme risks that could emerge from the misuse or from the loss of control of the most advanced frontier systems. 
Uh, and while the government's programmes expanded a little bit over time, it, its focus is still quite a way away from the very real and present harms of today's non-frontier AI systems, a, a lot of which come up only when an AI system is deployed in a, in a specific context. Uh, and safety itself is, is an intriguing framing for how we think about AI. Um, there isn't an established regulatory practice that, that tells us what AI safety even means. Um, but there are a lot of other fields where safety is at the middle of governance. So medicines, aviation, food, the energy system. These are really important technologies, systems and industries that big parts of our society and our economies depend on. And these things could be really dangerous, um, but we've become comfortable with their being embedded in our lives because their governance has evolved. And AI, and particularly the, the types of foundation or frontier models we've, uh, we're talking about uh, at the summit, could come to play a similarly significant role in our lives uh, as AI becomes more integrated into the digital economy and into the goods and services we use every day. So today's session is about exploring what we can learn from other examples of governing critical systems. It's about what that governance seeks to achieve, uh, what practical things we might need to get good outcomes around AI in the same way as we have in other fields. And it's about what all this means for regulation. So how, how do we open things up to a world where AI is working in our best interests and not against them. And I'll start by talking about the case for governance, so the incentives, the accountability mechanisms and the other regula regulatory tools we use to get socially important outcomes. AI risks and harms have been with us, in fact, for many years now, um, whether explicitly called artificial intelligence or called other things like machine learning, data-driven systems or automated decision-making. To a limited extent, AI in, in this broad sense is, is already governed by existing legislation uh, across sectors, by laws across, around data governance and equality, and within sectors by domain-specific regulators, like those that we've got for financial services or for medicine. But in the UK, this patchwork of laws has a lot of gaps. And the harms of AI are now acknowledged by national governments, not least in the UK's AI regulation white paper. These aren't potential and hypothetical harms, they're real ones, which are happening to real people. AI systems have already been responsible for false arrest, for denying healthcare for, to millions, for amplifying disinformation on social media, uh, for propagating racist medical information. There are lots of ways to think about the harms that can arise from AI, and the way we think about them at ADA um, generally breaks down into four groups. So, so the first of these groups of harms is supply chain. Um, these are sometimes easy to ignore or, or to not see, and they arise in the process of creating AI models, in, in particular the very large and data-hungry models which are at the frontier. Um, supply chain harms can include those to the humans in low-wage economies who are labelling toxic outputs to train the models, um, the environmental impact of very energy-hungry <coughs> model training runs, and the use of personal data or protected intellectual property uh, as fuel for the models. A second category is the more visible <laughs> accidental harms, um, AI systems failing or acting in un anticipated ways, so self-driving car crashes or discrimination when sifting job applications. Um, a third category is misuse harms uh, from AI systems being deliberately used in malicious ways, um, so for example generating misinformation using generative AI tools. And finally, there are structural or systemic harms where AI use can, can subtly alter social or political or economic systems. Um, so, for example, by creating more market concentration or having an aggregate effect of misinformation on democratic institutions. Um, so there are four, four big groups already, and, and in some cases these harms are already well evidenced. Um, so, for example, the tendency of AI systems to reproduce harmful biases from their training data. But in, in other types of harm, we either haven't yet collected good evidence or we don't know yet to what extent those harms will actually arise. But it, it, in any case, all of these types of harms could reasonably be in scope for AI safety um, because they're all harms that people should be kept safe from. And the extent to which those harms are prevented or mitigated or addressed will all have a significant impact on whether AI systems are perceived as safe. Harms can show up at every stage of the AI life cycle and they can be visible in the lab or test environment or they can only show up later when AI is used in a particular human context. So this broad scope for safety and, and harm is, is supported by evidence of people's views about AI. 
our recent evidence review looking at what the public think about AI shows that people are aware of and are concerned about the risks of AI technologies and people want regulation to represent their best interests. Now, the AI Safety Summit is predicated on the assumption that the impact of AI on our society and our economy is going to be transformational. And in some respects, it's already true. Um, so AI is being deployed in important areas of scientific discovery, such as genomics, uh, against important social challenges, such as climate change, adaptation and mitigation. In the UK, varieties of AI have been adopted by business in most sectors of the economy, with varying levels of uptake and success. But still, it's important to think critically about claims from industry and government about how central AI will be to all our lives, and to assess those claims about against the best available evidence we have, uh, not just to accept the, the hype, uh, but to reflect carefully on what we can actually expect from these technologies and systems, and, and what costs we find acceptable in light of, of a balanced view of what we see the benefits to be. And while I'm, I've suggested some uh, sceptical and critical view, we should take the claim seriously. It, it's plausible, although not guaranteed, that AI systems could soon occupy a fundamental role in the operation of critical goods and services, public and private, which in turn would mean that some applications of AI uh, would be critical pro products and services for society and economy at large. So, and, and we should be paying attention not just to the generative technologies, but to the full range of predictive and analytic AI, much of which, as I said before, is already well understood. Um, so, for example, there's already considerable evidence about AI use and piloting within the UK public sector, um, with recent reports indicating government applications across benefit decisions, home office risk assessments, retrospective facial recognition in policing, uh, the testing of a Gov UK chatbot that would guide users in uh, navigating, navigating and accessing public services. All this integration, reliance and use in high-risk contexts means that the failure of AI systems could lead to severe consequences, some of which we already see, like people being denied much-needed financial support without recourse, or people being misidentified for crimes they didn't commit, or people being excluded from government services because they're advised poorly. The key point here is that if we're going to engage with the summit's premise of AI's transformational potential at face value, we ought to also expect its governance to reflect the, the governance of similarly consequential systems. And this isn't the first time that regulations had to handle highly complex technologies that play a central social and economic role. There isn't a perfect analogue for AI, but if we look at how safety is understood in other domains like medicines, transport and food, we can get some useful inspiration for how to think about AI. The governance of medicine, transport and food is designed to ensure those sector systems and technologies function as intended, that the risks they pose are managed holistically, and that the goods and the benefits they produce are widely available at a reasonable cost. And a recurring theme across each of these regulatory regimes is the goal of ensuring that systems aren't only safe, but also that they enjoy public trust. And public trust requires, among other things, that people are provided with transparent information about how systems are used and how systems might affect their daily lives. It requires proving that systems are trustworthy, which means different things in different sectors. But ultimately, it means they can be relied on by the people who interact with and who depend on them. And evidencing trustworthiness can require the use of a wide range of mechanisms to ensure greater transparency, robust routes to accountability and redress when things go wrong, and it requires that the risk of harms occurring is proportionate to benefits. And a variety of interlocking mechanisms are used across these sectors to address the harms similar to those that AI produces, from requirements on drug developers to provide positive evidence about safety, efficacy and accessibility of products before they're market approved, uh, to know your customer regulations in banking, to detect and to mitigate bad actors, to market shaping powers uh, like financial schemes deployed by Ofgem to reduce carbon emissions. These governance me mechanisms are also designed to work with uncertainty. They're resourced to anticipate developments and they have powers flexible enough to take action when there's a problem. To be clear, we don't need better evidence to justify the regulation of AI. While the exact capabilities of some newer models might not be fully understood, there's over a decade of global research documenting AI impacts and documenting how to manage them. Technology will always have a frontier, and the frontier always contains uncertainty. 
we don't govern only once we're certain about bad, bad outcomes. We govern to anticipate and to manage possible outcomes and risks in pursuit of being able to safely use and to rely on new technologies. And we, we set the governance for that up preemptively. So, properly enforcing good governance frameworks requires empowered, well-resourced regulatory institutions with access to the right information. So, we should welcome the important contributions the UK government's making to understanding AI risks through the research and safety policies published over the last few weeks and through the commitments it's made so far. A national AI safety institute for developing shared understanding and techniques for managing AI risks could be important parts for addressing this puzzle. But they're not sufficient. Regulations required and soon. To take the comparison of aviation, to build an understanding of the risks of AI without the means to enforce the conclusions would be like studying all the safety measures we need to land a plane safely, runways, air traffic control and so on, but then not requiring airports to implement those measures and further to leave ourselves without the power to force remedial action for the foreseeable future while plane after plane tries to land safely. To take this even further, it's, it's much easier to open the skies between countries and to agree the ne necessary international rules if we know each nation's got the powers to compel compliance. International institu institutions can't function effectively without sufficiently powerful domestic regimes and domestic institutions that have got the wherewithal to implement measures that have got international consensus, from our financial systems to our response to climate change. National and international have to go together to be effective. So, as the government repeats this week that it won't rush to regulate AI, we should remember what's at stake. Because if AI is really going to have yet more impact on all our lives, and regulation of AI will put us on the path to a more just, equitable society, then surely it makes sense to get started. We should be wary of simplistic pictures of what legislation and regulation are, and what they do. There's a misconception that regulation has to be set in stone and has to be inflexible, but that's not the case. It's possible to design a regulatory capability that can govern flexibly under uncertainty, as was done with the UK Digital Markets Bill. We don't have a crystal ball to show us all the potential future impacts and risks of AI systems, but we can equip a regulator with the responsibility and the tools to minimise harms to people and society, no matter what may arise. Creating a meaningful and flexible capability to govern AI will require legislative backing. Research ADA published over the summer shows significant gaps in the UK's regulatory coverage. These gaps span from sectors and public services lacking a regulator to enforce proposed AI principles to an ina inadequate set of powers for most regulators to look across the AI lifecycle, leaving them unable to catch AI, AI harms at the source. Giving regulators the responsibility, the powers and the resources to address these gaps can only be meaningfully done with legislation. And among other functions, legislation in the UK could mandate tests for AI manufacturers in the same way that cars are crash tested. It could determine liability for things that go wrong, uh, like when super, supermarket food makes you unwell. It could build in a voice for people who are going to be impacted by AI, as we have with planning permission. And it can enshrine the ability to contest a decision made about you by AI, where our current recourse me mechanisms fall short. Some of these mechanisms bear resemblance to commitments made by developers in recent weeks, but voluntary policies are not the same as regulation. The last decade of voluntary policies and commitments from tech leaders on issues from online disinformation to hate speech have shown there's no meaningful replacement for hard rules. Many of the generative products released in the last year have been released despite the concerns of internal developer ethics teams. Recent years of research on ethical AI teams at tech companies shows voluntary commitments and ethical practices are often applied ad hoc and are unfortunately easily pushed to the side in favour of market incentives and shareholder interest. So we do need hard regulation. We also need the resources to achieve it. The scale of support needed to govern this general purpose technology is likely to be in the same order of magnitude as that for regulators responsible for other key parts of our economic, social and technological infrastructure. This suggests staffing in the hundreds or thousands and annual, annual expenditure in the tens to the hundreds of millions. And we must be clear about how the domestic AI regulation we need can practically be achieved. As the UK seeks to lead an international conversation on making AI safe, there are only a couple of opportunities for meaningful legislation. If an AI bill doesn't make it into the King's speech next week, then the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill, currently before the House of Commons, might be one of the only viable legislative vehicles before 2025 
due to the near certainty of a general election next year and the likely disruption to legislative timetabling. We've seen the, the fast pace at which AI capabilities have grown in the last year, along with its equally rapid integration into products and services that people and businesses use every day. But we've also seen the ways in which AI is causing harm. Allowing these harms to carry on would put real people's lives and livelihoods in jeopardy, and it would mean gambling the potential loss of public trust in a, one of the most promising technologies we have, and the benefits of its use along with it. So to only begin to debate the legislative tools we need to manage the resulting impacts in over another year's time would be too late to effectively manage many of the established risks we've seen fall out of the last year of AI development. Regulation develops beyond the policy-making process in contact with the real world, and it's important we start that part of the iterative development process as soon as possible. We should recognise that even a bill published tomorrow would still have a long road to implementation, and that there'd necessarily be an intervening period where systems will continue to be deployed and integrated under our existing patchy regulatory frameworks, with developers of AI marking their own homework on whether their systems present risks and whether those risks are really mitigated. As international representatives gather at Bletchley, this makes it critical for governments to secure meaningful, detailed commitments from industry on how they'll carry the responsibility of mitigating all AI harms, not just those at the frontier, in the interim, and hold industry publicly to account for meeting those expectations ahead of fuller regulation. This intervening period makes it also all the more urgent that governments set out roadmaps to regulation, clearly signalling that sticking plasters that we implement in the short term will be bolstered as soon as possible. This doesn't need to come at the expense of the benefits of the technology. In fact, quite the contrary. As we heard yesterday from Raman Chowdhury, brakes help us go faster because then we trust the car to handle higher speeds. At ADA, we'll continue to contribute to evidence and to challenge government to produce a regulatory regime that evidence <coughs> suggests will make AI work for people and society. We've just published a policy briefing outlining what we can learn from safety regulation that kicks off a deeper dive into those sector comparisons I made earlier. And we look forward to speaking to many of you about how we can adapt those lessons to the challenge of AI. We're also very keen to broaden this discussion out today in the spirit of the fringe. And to help us do that, we're joined by a brilliant panel who my colleague Michael uh, will hopefully now introduce. Thank you very much.